Architekturzentrum Wien. Welcome to this evening event at Architekturzentrum Wien. It's the third edition of our Wohn Impulse, a series of cooperation with the City of Vienna, the Housing Department, and the Department, of, Department for International Strategies. We have two fantastic architectural offices tonight as our guests, from Paris, Sophie Delay, and from Vienna, PPAG architects Anna Popelka and, Ge and Georg Poduschka. Both will present their work. These lectures will be followed by a joint discussion. Unfortunately, Sophie can't be here tonight due to the strike of the Austrian Airlines. And as I said before, I'm always in solidarity with striking workforces. But this time, it's really a shame that Sophie can't be with us. But I think we are all experienced in the hybrid format. And it was just not impossible to book a train or anything else. It's all booked out, and it just didn't fit in the schedule. So we have to do it in a hybrid format. I'm very sorry for this, because I would also have loved to meet the two offices, PPAG and Sophie's. Today's title is Alles bleibt anders, Everything stays different, how housing remains adaptable. As early as in the 1960s, Dennis Scott Brown noticed that users' wishes for housing were no longer anticipated in architect studios, but were produced in the advertising agencies of Madison Avenue, and that these wishes were very conservative. Change and housing, how do they go together? After all, more than any other field of architecture, housing is characterized by great persistence, by stabilized habits, dominated by familiar images, in which, as described by Scott Brown, personal and mass media images and experiences are intertwined. Even architecture students sometimes have, have been led on long detours in order to transcend the housing they have learned. A few years ago, PPAG architects paid tribute to this phenomena, titling an exhibition, Do You Really Want to Live Like Your Mother? Maybe the coronavirus pandemic has led to some change, because overnight new realities and demands were placed on one's own four walls, and it raised questions like, how can units be built that can be used freely and remain flexible? How can we go beyond what we have already know in the housing sector? And these are some of the topics that we will discuss tonight. But before, before we do so, I will give the floor to our cooperation partner, to Kurt Hofstetter, former head of the IBA Vienna, the International Building Exhibition. It's always a pleasure to work with you and Amila Sebegovic. And uh, I would also like to take the chance to thank Lene, who is in charge of, the, of this cooperation at AZW, curating and organizing the series. Thanks to all of you, and welcome, Kurt. Thank you, Angelika. I'm very pleased to continue this format of con uh, collaboration between the Housing Research Department of the City of Vienna and AZW. As you said, it's an ongoing cooperation since many years, and I'm very happy that we could start it in IBA and uh, just continue. Many thanks for that to you and to Lene Benz as well for curating this. So today we are very much looking forward uh, to two very exciting contributions. Sophie Delay, I'm very sorry that you're not here. I know you would have liked to be here. Uh, and it's, it's a little funny, as you said, Angelica, when we, as elder generation, talk about uh, this saying in German, it says, alle Räder stehen still, wenn unser starker Arm es will. And you talk about it and you uh, uh, think, oh, you can tell something to the youth. And now it's happening again. And we're not so happy sometimes. So, uh, But Sophie's contribution will be no less exciting, I guess, as her work has been focusing on socially committed architecture for many years, showing us examples of adaptability uh, to housing needs that are changing over the times. And as a local response, I'm also very much looking forward to the contribution from PPAG, uh, because their work is also characterized time and again by 
new spatial concepts uh, for diverse constellations of usage and for uh, flexible living in general. So uh, let's just see those two examples and thank you for coming. It's my pleasure now to introduce our first speaker, Sophie Delay. She founded her office in Paris in 2008 and since then has become a leading figure in public housing. She's also a teacher at universities like in Versailles and in Lausanne. In Lausanne, she heads the Domestic City Lab Research Laboratory. Sophie devotes herself exclusively to the question of habitat. Her outstanding projects in Dijon, Lille, Paris, and Nantes have won numerous awards, among them the Schelling Architecture Prize in 2022. In many of her projects, open plan spaces, non-hierarchical floor plans, and expandable uses adapt to the meat of the, of the future residents. Based, her approach is based on the idea that housing affects the greatest number of people. And therefore, it is one of the most powerful forces for transforming the world. In doing so, she also seeks to restore housing, often considered a minor art form, to its rightful place. Sophie, I'm very curious to hear your lecture. The floor is yours. Hello, um, everybody, and thank you, Angelica, for your invitation and your presentation. Do you see my screen, and is it okay for you? Yes, we see your screen. Okay, perfect. Uh, I'm really glad to be here and to meet um, Anna and Georg. Uh, I'm so so sad to be in Paris, but it's uh, like this today. So today I will uh, talk about uh, a multitude of desert rooms. And more preciously, I will present uh, 710 anacin rooms. Because uh, as time passed, we see uh, two major changes. In one side, we are more and more on Earth, what you see here. So we live uh, densely in a sort of uh, new mandatory condition. And we have to think how we can live together in a nice way and in another side, you see also that the society is becoming uh, atomized. So you can see here how we are moving away from what we might call a conventional household composition with the nuclear families in the 60s, with father, mother, children. And it changes to very little units with a lot of uh, independency for students, young workers, mononuclear family, seniors, children, children that have their own domain that is shared between father and mother, so they are also independent uh, people. So it can be seen, this situation can be seen as a factor of solitude, but at the same time, uh, new forms of community and relationships are emerging that are less conventional and less hierarchical than before. So I think that for architects, it's a, an opportunity to put these things on the table and find uh, the forms for housing that can emancipate this reality, living in with uh, independence and with community. The second fact uh, is that on the left, in the 60s, a home was a home. I mean, home and city were really separated. And the home accommodated some functions and the town, the other ones. So at home, uh, we cooked, we ate, we shared time in the living room, we slept, we washed, and we read our letters. And in the city, we meet all together, we vote, we grow, we work, we study, we play sports. And we just had a little window from the inside to the outside world. It was the television and the newspaper. But later, uh, the cell phones, internet and email enable us to leave the city like a home. I feel, I can feel 
at home anywhere now with my internet address and my phone. And I am personally, personally reachable everywhere. And I no longer need to go home to get my paper later because I've got my mails, my emails. So at that time, you know, uh, when in 2000, I was a student and I was working to prepare my diploma. And I realized in that time that my apartment was almost useless to me because to fight my stress, I swam every day. So I washed my body at the swimming pool and I met my friends at the cafe. I studied in the university library and I ate at the university restaurant. So I didn't need any bathroom, kitchen, living room and desk in my bedroom. My apartment was uh, just a way to go to bed, in fact. So for my diploma project, I was asking myself a very simple question, but a paroxysmic one, yes. It was, but if the city was taken everything away from housing, what's left at home? My problem was the fact that the answer can be different for everyone. For me, for example, if I don't have any home, I can't uh, cook for my friends, for example, and it's a problem. And for other people, they won't, uh, for example, uh, be able to play music at home. It's important for them. So the question was, how can I define the functions uh, that people need at home? And later, with the lockdown, the home became as a city. All the functions that are usually outside in the city has been brought into the house. We meet all together at home, we can vote, we can work, we can study, we can play sports. And for example, tonight I'm in Paris with you uh, in the center of uh, in the Architecture Centrum in Vienne uh, from but I'm at home, for example, so the public space came come in my in my home. So how can I define the functions that people need at home? And I think that a functional work is no more possible for architects. Uh, just by the simple fact that we have to economize construction and that if we follow this evolution, we need, I don't know, 200 meters square by apartment to put all this function in it. So we have to open new perspectives on housing. So as an architect, we, can, we can't keep a functionalist uh, point of view uh, as we used to, and we have to change our point of view and look for other ways of uh, looking for it. But, you know, unfortunately, for some decades, capitalist mechanisms have set in stone the most profitable and optimist typologies and making them more and more effective and economical. So the quality has decreased and uh, the people are limited in their freedom. So this evening I will propose a modular way, like this, I uh, don't know if you know him because he's a French writer, but this marvelous book is created by Raymond Queneau. And this book uh, allows readers to compose an infinite number of poems from a finite number of, of verses that Keno has written. So I will present uh, projects now, and to select them, I've given myself three criteria. The first one is the housing is a collection of uh, identical rooms. The second one is the fact that each room is free to use, unassumed. And the third one is that each room is part of a network of rooms. And in fact, it means that, why those three criteria? Because the scale of the ancient household disappears in favor of individual scale and collective one. It means uh, for architecture that the scale of the past apartment disappears in favor of the scale of the rooms and the scale of the collective block. So we present those three um, projects. 
that are in Nantes, in Dijon, and the next one is in Munich. And these are not 55 units or 40 units or 100 units, but 210 rooms or 200 rooms or 300 rooms. So that's why it's 710 rooms today. So for each to compare the projects, uh, each room, uh, each unit, uh, the base uh, is made by a unit of four rooms or a unit of five rooms, or a unit of three rooms. And each room has a different size and a different surface. So the first one is in Nantes, and um, the dwelling is a, are a collection of identical rooms and assigned. And one of them is detached and placed on the other side of the garden. So you don't live in one building, but mainly in one building and a bit in another. And there is a kind of elsewhere at home, so you can choose what you want to do alone or together in each room, because each room is like a little living room. And each room has a different link to the others. So all together they are like this. And here is the plan, you've got three rooms on the ground floor and two on the level, high level. And you get also the possibility to connect the plus room to one apartment on the right, you, you, are, you live in the, red, the pink apartment. In the middle, the plus room is uh, on the yellow one and the blue is on the left, the blue is on the blue one. So it means that uh, each size of apartment can move with the movement of the society. So you enter by little uh, pathways. You enter in your private garden, that is the, where intimacy is protected by curtain and, and plants. And you live in the two buildings, in the two sides, with the one room um, that is on the garden and another one in the other side that is disconnected as the little design that I proposed of, um, of Andrea Branzi uh, that connected or disconnected the people in the community. So on the uh, level, other level, you've got another room and what is funny is also that one of your room opens on a collective uh, courtyard. So each apartment is connected to another one. And what you see also is that each room has a different relationship between uh, with uh, the private space or public or common one. So the bedrooms are very big because they are four by four meter, it's uh, 60 meter, 16 meter square. So for example, uh, children has chosen to share their bedroom because it's very big to have a sort of playground uh, to, to play all together. And the kitchen is in one room. So the kitchen is not only a kitchen, it's also a place where you can have your table to have dinner and also sometimes some sofas, some televisions. It's like a sort of little living room also. And in the other side of the garden, this uh, girl has made a sewing workshop uh, because she wanted to have this sort of a place at home. So here is the courtyard that connected four um, apartments uh, four rooms. So here is a master plan. You you discover that it's ten linear little buildings that where gardens are making some pairs of buildings, and it, um, between those pairs you find the courtyards, the common courtyards, or the public uh, courtyard, the public spaces. So just a few photos to imagine a little bit. The second project is in Dijon. Perhaps you know it. It's 40 units and 200 rooms, and the rooms are a little smaller. They are 3.6 3 meters, 
um, and um, to work with our clients and to preserve ourselves from um, um, from standardization, we've done a sort of atomization of the program, just like the atomized society uh, we are dealing with. And this was sort of strategy to never use the word housing or dwelling during our discussion with him uh, to get out for our reflexes and to prevent the experimentation. So here is our new vocabulary based on a letter that is a square room whose side measures uh, 3.6 meter, uh, 13 meters square, and this surface doesn't exist in social housing programs. So this room is a sort of unexpected room. Uh, it looks like uh, nothing. So these rooms are connected and connected by large uh, sliding doors, which allow the creation of double rooms for the living room, for example. And it also allows everyone to choose freely whether to be alone or together. So here is the exterior room. It's a loggia here, or it can be a terrace. And you see, if you use two rooms for the bedroom, it's the same way to be in this in the, this apartment. You will you still have two rooms for the living room. So depending on the place you choose for the bedrooms, you can choose to free up views uh, across the room, or diagonally, or all around the exterior side. So here are the three special configurations. And through the day, the space can evolve according to the people who are there. And each room is a small individual living room, but can also open up in a large common area, like in the, in the right on the top. So it's also possible to live differently than uh, in a classical household. Of course, uh, and you can have uh, shared flats or co-working and sometimes even what you see on the right is that one of the room can also have his, uh, its own access for a small office, for example. So all these rooms are all arranged in a repetitive structure, but it's not a repetitive project because each room has its uh, own quality. It's a solar orientation, it's views and it's relation to the, the other rooms, for example. And to vary the pleasures, we have created two types of windows. They are inhabited uh, windows because uh, we put the storage uh, on the facade. And um, in front of the garden, the public garden, the private, the common garden, uh, it's a bench to relax. And on the street side, it's an alcove with a curtain that allows us to extract uh, myself, to allows me to extract myself uh, completely and I can enter in this very little space and close the curtain and be alone um, in the streets, uh, but from home. It's a kind of strong relationship between individuality and the world. So here is the building. It's a kind of step because it's situated between small houses and a future high building. And here you see the 120 uh, windows from the, the garden. And here the 120 uh, windows on the future street side. And here a shared space that is perched in the treetops. And here you can see it from the existing pavilion. So you can see that uh, in this side, individuality of the rooms are visible. And in the other side, there is a sort of sentiment, collective sentiment by the massive uh, view. So the third one, um, it's a cooperative of uh, 300 people. This was a question and in the program. It was a cooperative for 300 people uh, that are, gonna, are organized in um, 100 uh, uh, changing households. 
So this question was perfect for us and we decided to propose one room per person, so 300 rooms. And what is particular is that one unit is just three rooms. But the rooms are big because they are 20 meters square. So it means that each room is a living room, a private or a um, convivial one. So you will see that uh, we propose a sort of game, um, a sort of pyramid uh, that can increase or decrease like the society and where each room can be connected or disconnected. So in we are a part of a block that is composed all around a central common courtyard, but we had just one part of this uh, building. So in the project, the green rooms are the convivial ones, and the red, the pink one, are the intimate in intimate one. So here is uh, the plan. And what is particular is that in this project, we propose uh, intimate rooms on the north uh, that are bedrooms and place to make sports, to study, to work, everything. And another uh, type of uh, rooms on the south are the kitchen. So we eliminate the living room because living room is everywhere. So we get, just get some bedrooms and kitchens. So what you see in blue is a connector. It's a little corridor that allows to us to connect uh, one, two or three uh, rooms, intimate rooms um, with uh, the apartment. So it means that, for example, Actually, it's inhabited like uh, on the top and tomorrow. Uh, so this is one apartment. You see the two corridors to connect uh, each room if you want. And you see that the kitchen, the collective, the, um, sorry, the, um, the um, convivial rooms with the kitchen are singular because the kitchen is a double face kitchen so you can use it from the inside of the apartment or from the outside with your neighbors because you enter at home by a gangway uh, that connected uh, each people so the gangway is a very very convivial space here it is with all the kitchens that are connected so nobody has a bedroom uh, in this uh, face to protect the intimacy and here it's uh, the convivial room with the kitchen that can be used by the two sides. Here is the little corridor of the different bedrooms that are very big because 20 meters square. So it means that um, from the collective courtyard, um, all the facade is just a convivial facade with all the, uh, the kitchens. And in the other side, we decided to have uh, different windows for each room. So you see that um, you've got a possibility to have a sort of bar for the first one, a sort of desk for the second one, a sort of bench for the third one, or a sort of balcony for the fourth, fourth one. So it means that you've got uh, each uh, intimate room is uh, different from the other. So this is... Uh, the public view of uh, the collection of intimacy in the in the project. So I've got a personal uh, protocol. I always end my lectures with this uh, marvelous um, uh, citation of René Char, that is another po French uh, poet, and he said this thing: "At each communal meals, we invite freedom to sit down." The place remains empty, but the tables remain set. Thank you.
Thanks so much, Sophie. This was really great and gave, it a lot, gave us a lot of food for thought. Uh, not planning functions anymore, but rooms, uh, identical and a kind of neutral rooms, and that still uh, uh, explore such a lot of flexi flexibility and uh, individ individual solutions. We will come back to all this afterwards when we have our joint discussion, and I will now go on introducing uh, PPAG, and I'm sure you will also be excited to listen to their, and to see their projects. See you in a minute. PPAG Architects was founded by Anna Popelka and Georg Potuschka in Vienna in 1995, and since 2020, they also have an office in Berlin. They explore architecture in all dimensions, even in furniture dimensions. I think all of you know the ANSYS here at the Museumsquartier, which is also like an early, one can say now an early work of yours, uh, still, which is still functioning very, very well. They did amazing schools, of course, we all know uh, housing projects uh, and go up to our urban planning. Tonight, of course, we will concentrate especially on their housing projects. Uh, which include spaces for diverse a constellation of uses and are based on their research on elastic homes. Uh, just to mention a few, like the famous Slim City in Vienna Aspen, uh, the Quartiers House in Sonnenwendviertel, or just now the um, Quartier in Breitenfurter Straße, which we maybe all know from the media, but I think there's even more to see in some very new ones from the IBA in Stuttgart, as I learned. Pepe AG received numerous international awards, including uh, nominations for the Mies van der Rohe Prize, the City, uh, the City of Vienna Prize for Architecture, the Adolf Loos State Prize for Design, and the Hans Hohlen Art Prize for Architecture. They say themselves about their work, the goal is a good life for all, due to the explosive nature of the climate crisis, the search for the necessary new is mandatory now. This it is what we are working on. Nice to hear. The stage is yours, Anna and Georg. Thank you, Angelica. Um, I have to do this now. The, Georg <laughs> told me <laughs> I had to. So, thank you. Ah, yeah, super. Yeah, so good evening uh, also from my side. Hello, Sophie. Uh, yeah, uh, there are some coincidences, I think, between our offices. So I'm looking forward to our talk. Yeah, when we talk about uh, flexibility in housing, we actually mean uh, freedom of choice and uh, space of possibilities. So please allow me to elaborate that a little. Uh, in our architectural thinking, um, space is a category on it, of its own. It's more or less strongly sensible. It's influencing body and brain. It's basically, yes, it's super functional, non-functional, offering many possibilities of use, can be protective, supportive, connecting, stimulating, uh, this is a project for a terrace house, uh, which we made a long time ago, seen from inside out. So it's made from equivalent rooms, each rising up southwards and combinable in manifold ways. Of course, we all deserve good space for our development. So we all deserve beauty as a sort of materialized or built appreciation. It is our responsibility as planners to provide the best possible space for everyone, including and especially those who presumably cannot choose it because of war and collapsing climate resulting in migration. Architecture is a complex synthesis of various content, always. No? The demand of, uh, on architectures are constantly changing, and now in a global society, the needs vary widely. Everyone should be free to decide where and how they live, where and how internal and external conditions are inseparable. 
the urban context is as important as the home. Think of the increasing importance of uh, public space, the smaller our apartments become, or uh, the conditions of ground floor living, uh, in, in, um, depending on the, on the surrounding. That all matters, that all is interwoven, and we develop a project from inside out and from outside in. And in the following, I'll show some examples illustrating this interdependency. So uh, to be begin with the urban scale, so everybody wants to be in attractive places, of course, so as the city center, and uh, that is the basis and the motor of the urban, and that legitimizes also density makes it even necessary as a political means against social imbalance. And that all doesn't happen by itself, we have to work on it. And so we need different typologies or morphological proposals for urban density that are offering identification power and a sense of home that are neighbor friendly, that give and don't take away qualities that improve the situation and that solve problems, and that open up places for living, that make probably hostile areas habitable, that form a framework for a diverse community, and that form mixed-used neighborhoods, city quarters from the beginning. There are countless options, be it redensification, so densification of existing structures or new building. Nearly none are tried out. And as we come to the apartments, we personally believe in the widest possible range of individual options across all our projects. So they are not offering everything, but they are focusing on something special. We know uh, that this claim is some sort of paradox in social housing because we don't personally know the future residents. It is kind of reverse participation or tailor-made mass production, as we name it, to have the choice to take the suit which really fits best. In this case, for this project, uh, there we had very different units and a sort of internal tourism came up. So the residents visiting each other to see uh, the neighbor's home. And they have now a very good community. And what we get, or at least support uh, by that, is social stabil stability. So, so to say, an equilibrium of the unequal produced by the maximum mix, never by monoculture. But reality is that the housing industry is still offering the same homes as 100 years ago with the one, two, three, four rooms, even though the nuclear family is now in the min minority and only exists for a short time, as we can recognize from the statistic family here. Mm. No. Yeah, uh, it's below here. <laughs> and with, uh, with a precisely defined, also standardized sizes and proportions of rooms and balconies up to the length of cupboards and kitchen units. So as if everybody had the same cooking habits or the same amount of stuff. In this sense, our homes, of course, they influence us and we are standardized, we are shaped by them, and we want to live like our influencers. On the other hand, as we all know, there exist many other forms co of cohabitation, patchwork families, single parents, shared apartments, living, working together, so uh, that are not uh, met by this offer. It's a chicken and egg problem. A home is never completely private. 
there is an ambiguity, there is a fluidity in housing concerning the relation of the private and the public. Both are influencing each other and flowing into each other. The good home pro provides a balance uh, between the private and the public realm. So we like to f uh, feel secure, but feel and see and smell the other. So we are interested in that. And we experienced ourselves this thin line between the private and public life uh, by moving into a ground floor store for a pretty long time, facing directly to the, to the street. And it had been empty for a long time and we detected it somehow for living. So the side effect was it was not expensive. We often had lunch outside. I think these types of ground floor living are really a contribution to city life, the city life. It's in the sixth district. Uh, and that would be otherwise uh, to be uh, too expensive for us at that time. So facing to the streets, southwards, and with a little courtyard. And it's 90 square meters, room height 4.5 plus walls. And we bought it, we moved in, and nearly doubled the space by installing uh, a low gallery level. And in this stage, uh, so we had the, uh, we, the office moved uh, down uh, in uh, on ground floor and upstairs we had two sleeping rooms uh, facing to the street uh, for three and a small kitchen and a gallery a for, for a home gallery of looking down to uh, the office or connected to the office. And then, some years after, the office moved out, and so we had a luxury home. <laughs> we had two sleeping rooms only left, so one big room uh, to the south and one small for us uh, to the courtyard. And we had a huge living room then with a kitchen, and there, it, that really, uh, animated activities and a lot of parties uh, for children and also for, the, for us adults um, and in, in, including the sidewalk that was really nice and we even had lectures there and I'm showing only these two main steps we did a lot of ex we had a lot of experience with it and we did a lot of experiment also in between and for example, as closing the void, which was not such a good idea. So, and it could be also dance studio or office uh, only, or a restaurant or something else. And from this experience, we implemented a similar approach uh, into another, into a big uh, social housing project for Gesiba. Uh, so. There, the ground floor area is very open to the park behind, the Bedna Park, uh, with a lot of covered space, protecting space, and the line is showing uh, the, the, um, the uh, it's dividing living and uh, non-living, residential and non-residential. So it was prohibited, uh, living on ground floor was prohibited. And that was a very similar situation like ours before. So we connected these different uses, the small business or office or shop downstairs and the apartment upstairs uh, via an inner staircase, but with two entrances on every level. So it's really flexible and it can be used for living combined with this small business um, or for, of course, for only business or secretly also for only living because the uh, ground floor is slightly elevated so you are not directly at the same height as the public around. Another project is uh, a project for Seestadt Aspen that is the satellite city of Vienna, 
we in Vienna know it, <laughs> uh, the urban layout was prescribing a perimeter block and our proposal offered a more permeable network of path within, of course, the, re uh, the building regulations. And so with a sequence of paths and squares, in total it's 13 differently high and oriented slender houses, spending lively alternation of shade and sun during the day. The floor plans are tower house-like somehow, with an all-around orientation, with a panoramic view, so wide views and close views, and the wandering sunlight in the apartments throughout this day. And there are no bearing walls except one column in the center, and so we can have a one up to five room apartment with the same floor plan. And that's only made possible by the general layout of this tower housing, houses uh, system. So yeah, let's see what happens when we rethink uh, the usual room sizes, as Sophie also likes to do. So uh, this is a project developed for one of uh, Berlin's six housing companies. And everything was wonderful before it was suddenly cancelled shortly before submission. Um, and I think it blew up some one important horizon. So the necessary new seems to be frightening. So in comparison, uh, we always see that in comparison to the conventional apartment uh, sizes. So this is would be normally a, a two-room apartment of 55, 56 square meters. In our case, we have eight rooms uh, positioned around a three-sided uh, exposed central room, and three go away for kitchen and bathroom and storage, and five are left for variable use. So uh, we, we can think about the growing and shrinking family or other forms of shared living over the time of living and working. So it tackles the unexpected and the temporary, the new baby, uh, friends staying overnight, the visit of the patchwork child every second week, someone to be cared of for a certain time. So we all remember the sudden need for a quarantine or home working room, uh, not to see at the, sit at the kitchen table uh, that we've seen during the pandemic. So we played that through in all the common size categories. And then um, during an, an exhibition at AIDES in Berlin, we installed a one-to-one -one model for the, of this, we call it now elastic apartment, as a display into the gallery, which can be seen in the background, and the column is also not belonging to the apartment. So, uh, yeah, the small rooms turned out to be very cozy. There was a lot of lounging around. Fifty visitors in the living room, also no problem. Uh, the urban layout is very adaptable, also due to the multi-orientation of the apartments, I'm sure. So here it loops around trees in a park, staying permeable for the neighborhood. So we call it somehow tiptoeing urban design, not to take something away. And these elastic apartments are producing an elastic urban fabric so to say. So it's nearly every situation can be um, you know what I mean. <laughs> um, yeah, and it is not only that it doesn't uh, take anything away, it contributes to the city's social life as uh, the ground floor level is a space uh, to meet and interact for chance encounters. So 
we developed that further, this elastic apartment, in very different variations. Uh, here it is this idea of layers, like tree rings with bearing walls facing rectangular to the facade, to daylight, and they are shifting, and by that offering differing, different uh, room combinations, as you can see at the right above. So. So, and now we are happy to be able to realize that idea in the following project, uh, which is done within the scope of the IBA 27 Stuttgart, the International Building Exhibition. And it's for a very dedicated building cooperative that knows all its members. And we are commissioned for the urban design, for a new mixed use quarter, very climate conscious energy supply and mobility and construction, all made from wood, uh, all trees preserved and so on. And it's 250 apartments uh, with uh, very, uh, which enable very different forms of housing for different socio-economic backgrounds and generations. Um, yeah, and we have been commissioned for the first building phase which we can see, ah, it's not, a, yeah, with the green roof here, that's the first building phase. And there are a lot in this house, there are a lot of common amenities for children and youth and a maker space and office space, uh, a huge class house for uh, the whole community for a supply with greens and very different apartments. So one residential group for the elderly at the central point and uh, then row houses, one and two story row houses, then special apartments, so to say apartment within the apartment. So very small apartments within one big common living room and also this elastic type, uh, yeah, here. And on the left, on the right side above, uh, you can see the trick. So um, the highlighted room here, it can be connected by predeterminated breaking points to one apartment or the other. And a lot of protective covered space because it's hotter and it rains a lot. Yeah, the street is also included into the playing field. It's partly built over. And yeah, and we all know uh, that building causes, that's the last project, the building causes 40% uh, of uh, CO2 emissions. And originally we intended to achieve the 1.5 target, which means food security for millions of people. So we are in pressure under pressure. And this project is also for IBA 27. It was not successful. Yeah, it's a pity for us. Uh, despite the guiding principle of the competition brief, architecture is the leading medium of climate change. And uh, the starting point is we have to stop land use. So AZW had recently this wonderful exhibition on that issue, on that topic. So. Land is a contested good between construction or building and uh, harvesting agriculture or uh, uh, harvesting energy and also the open space for leisure. leisure. So uh, that's really a problem, a conflict, a natural conflict probably. And our pro proposal was to multiply somehow the land. And we did that by slightly changing the given urban design. What's also a problem, but that's another issue next uh, Wednesday probably, <laughs> that all uh, development plans are looking like this. Okay, and we uh, took some parts out and we connected other parts uh, also to have, uh, uh, to get rid of uh, the staircases and so, and to have more open space. And the challenge was of the brief was to be CO2 neutral within 15 years. 
And so one big lever was the soil, terra preta. The soil is used as a CO2 sink. And the second lever was we developed a constructional system uh, as a modular skeleton construction with low carbon barrel walls because they have no steel in, in, inside. So it's an old construction. Uh, yeah, the lot of terra preta possible. So again, tiptoeing into the landscape. Um, the ground floor, from ground floor to sixth floor, we have this topic of urban agriculture and self-sufficiency as a community building tool in all facets. And we have a glass house. Yeah, and a lot of uh, covered and ventilated areas. And it's various easily changeable units. I wouldn't call them apartments for very different forms of living and working together. And there are also a lot of common rooms and uh, common terraces. And so, and the unavoidable car park we had to have with a room height of 2.10 is intended to become a production unit by removing every second floor. We had a sports field, guest apartments, office space, kindergarten, open lunch table, elderly, everything. So it's open for variable use, yet defined. And there are these covered open spaces for agriculture, for leisure, for different uses over all the floors. It's a ventilation. So the construction is forming the social framework. And the shown projects are only some possibilities within a huge spectrum. The great transformation requires us uh, to rethink what we do in our profession uh, and to do things differently than before. And consequently, the, these uh, buildings will look different. And if we make an effort, it brings us closer to the good space for all. Thank you. Thanks a lot uh, to all, to both of you. This, I think this, it's, really, it's really absolutely amazing how both of your offices are uh, working in this field of uh, public housing, multi-story housing, which is so regulated and so strict and so economically under pressure, and what you, are able, what you have been able to realize in, in this field and how much of innovation and flexibility and freedom you brought into that. And I think there are some interesting overlaps, for example, the, this kind of the rooms uh, which you put uh, now uh, around the central uh, living space. Uh, Sophie really restricted to this kind of uh, uh, identic uh, room, like not thinking in units anymore. So maybe the two of you could respond to each other, how you see these overlaps and still the differences, of course, between the, your two approaches. Yeah, um, very interesting um, because we've we work so much on the apartment itself, and that's a forbidden uh, field in architecture. Uh, <laughs> at least uh, uh, here in Vienna, it is forbidden to work on the apartment itself. The apartment is fixed. The apartment you cannot discuss is. <laughs> I don't know if it is the same in France. <laughs> I've studied one year in France, and at that time it was uh, the apartment had been very fixed. So every room for yes. us. Yes, 
Yes, it's very fixed and it's also uh, now fixed by new rules and new new uh, inhabits um, habitude that makes it uh, absolutely unmovable. So it's quite uh, complicated, in fact. What I really uh, like in your your project, your the elastic one, is the fact that I know that we are we have we can't change the um, the surfaces, uh, so we can we can uh, imagine new balances. For example, today I just shown a project with identical rooms. But um, what is really nice with your project, with your proposition, is the fact that you can also say, no, we change the size of each room and we can have very big places at home and very little ones. And sometimes very little ones are uh, incredibly uh, magic um, because, I don't know, uh, two by two meters, just to put your bed. Mm -hmm. It's just uh, like uh, in a medieval period when you were just sleeping with your room that is your bed. So I really like the fact that actually uh, we always try to move just little parameters uh, but that are really efficient to make new propositions, in fact. And that's true that, for example, uh, inviting uh, 20 person at home to share, I don't know, uh, a birthday uh, is so so nice. In the in the traditional apartment for social housing in France, you can't meet uh, in a large group because uh, the living room is just for the family and one people that can come. So actually. We live in different communities, in different groups, so it's important to propose um, um, also collective or public things at home because mm -hmm. the relationship between public and private are changing so extremely. So it's really, I really like it uh, in your project. The housing company was so suspicious that the small rooms would be claustrophobic. And that was the reason that we built it in one-to-one -one by cardboard <laughs> to make them not. sure, yeah. So, <laughs> it's a little bit like so uh, did, you, did you like it when with the, the one-to-one one, one model? Yes, they liked it. They uh, were convinced after that. Mm. But uh, you know, it. there was this one person, <laughs> the killer. <laughs> so what, what I also really liked uh, about both of your lectures that it became very clear that we can't really know how people want to live, like that it became so individual. And uh, so you need to offer a lot of possibilities because it's not only that over our lifespan we keep changing and our mm. family models or our ways of living and living together mm. change or living alone, uh, but uh, that we never know who, who's, who has what prof kind of preference, who likes to cook, who likes to read, who likes mm. to play music, who likes to do nothing, who likes to be with a lot of people and mm. housing has to accommodate all this and mm. I think uh, and I think putting such a lot of thinking and design mm. into that is really, is really amazing. And one thing, uh, last time, uh, Sophie, when we talked, we also talked about uh, this form of reality check that you said you like going back to your project, and yeah. uh, because most of the time you don't you don't know the users in public mm -hmm. housing. Mm -hmm. because if there is a cooperative or a bau group, maybe you know, but otherwise you won't know. And that you keep doing these reality checks and then learning from them. For example, putting the kitchen in this public area. We I think we talked about that one, and it's really nice to see the project coming now. Very yeah. You're realizing that you said you learned that from uh, revisiting from project, your projects. Yeah. Yeah. With the common courtyard, mm -hmm. I discovered that the common courtyard that were really uh, used uh, were some special one. I, I, it was not uh, something that I, I wanted, uh, that I knew before making it, it but uh, those courtyards that are really uh, good ones uh, that are really used uh, connect 
uh, for apartment, but for kitchen of apartments. So I understood by this visit that the kitchen is a strong way to connect neighbors. So that's why. And also uh, in a project, uh, an inhabitant explained me that uh, each uh, room is a living room. Uh, because uh, he's got a sofa in his bedroom, uh, in the kitchen he's got uh, the television, and etc., uh, etc. Et and at the end of the sentence, he said, actually, I don't need any living room. So that's why the final project is just three rooms without living room, just without two big bedrooms and one living room. So it's really interesting to meet the people, to, to learn. Uh, from them, new way of uh, of um, perceiving uh, our propositions, because they are like open propositions. But it's really, yes, it's really efficient to 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 know by them. But probably the clients would be. Uh, would say, oh my God, no living room, I can't have that. So, or they wouldn't have the idea by themselves. So it's your offer. Yeah. And, and this is, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and that's the particularity mm -hmm. of uh, housing, of architects who are um, making a lot of housing design. I think it's a real particular program because, uh, if, for example, if you are, um, uh, um, designing for, for example, a theater, uh, you need um, the knowledge of the director of the, the, the theater to do your project, and you're not the director of the, of, so you don't, you, you are not um, a user, but when you are drawing just housing design, you're always the architect and the inhabitant. Mm -hmm. And each people you meet, your client, uh, les ouvriers, the people who build, <laughs> um, are also people who, who are inhabitants. So you can, it's sometimes it's dangerous because everybody has an idea of uh, what is a good uh, housing. But sometimes it's also nice because you can share you can explain, you can, you can, uh, everybody can feel uh, your project and share it. So it's, it's a sim singularity uh, of uh, our program that is a strong singularity. So everyone is an expert in housing, so it's, it's a daily expertise all of us have. But it also seems like the way that, Sophie, that you are explaining also from your experiences uh, uh, building this one-to-one -one in the gallery, that people are much uh, out there, they wouldn't follow us, or I think, and sometimes I also have the feeling that most of the people are much mm more, I think, I think far ahead than what, mm -hmm. what, what is done already. So do you think that the big uh, limitations are still in the building sector and in the corporations or that, that like I, many people me, would be yeah, ready? I think so. And somebody said that uh, at a certain time in history, uh, there came this level, this in-between level that separated um, as planners from uh, the people, <laughs> and so and and this decision making surface is, I'm afraid it's <laughs> to say it, it, it's uh, destroying somehow. Uh, and uh, so also the structure of the of the of the, of the construction. Uh, sector, I think, especially of the building sector. For example, if you look at Vienna, we have a couple of, of really big firms and they kind of define the way how you build. Do you think that's, that plays a role or not? No, I, I don't mean it. I, I mean the decisions, uh, the juries, the decisions, the communal decisions that are not um, curious enough or not. Uh, so I think, uh, no, not the building companies. I mean, the, uh, we have. I, th yeah. I think they are very, everybody is very used to do as it is done since 100 years. Mm -hmm. That's always the same, not? And every part of the system is used uh, how how it is known, the convention. 
And the convention is a, a big marketing instrument. If you ask the people on the street, what would you wish from your apartment? Probably they say, oh, I would like to have three rooms. No? Um, because it is not known that it can be more. And I think what we, our experience, and I, I'm sure your experience too, what we have seen in your lecture is that uh, if you offer something more, it, it is used immediately, and uh, it is not of the users itself. They would use it immediately, and you could say, oh, the convention is very dysfunctional, because you cannot have a garden together with three neighbors in the conventional home, and the people immediately use it, no, if they have it. <laughs> or a kitchen in the gangway, or I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> we never had problems with uh, the residents. Yeah. We, we also had that time uh, when the Slim uh, City project was a kind of under, under huge discussion. It was one of the early projects in Seestadt Aspen. We made an event here called Reality Check, inviting different users, people living in these projects, and we just put it on the blackboard there, so it was known that we, picked, we didn't pick out special people, so just who wants to come and who wants to tell us about living in, in these kind of projects, and they were so fond of it, mm -hmm. so everyone was amazed, yeah, so it was really a nice experience. Something else uh, which uh, is really stunning about the way you think housing is that it's so much about the connection of the interior and the exterior, exterior. so it's also very much about connecting to the urban space, as also both of you <laughs> explained, we are connected to the world to the urban space anyway through the different medias and through the way we, we live and eat outside, inside, meet people outside, inside. But the way how this changes your architecture, the, how this changes design, I think that's also something very interesting that, that overlaps in your approaches. Maybe one of you could say something to that? <laughs> or not? <laughs> Any more questions from the audience? <laughs> <laughs> Don't be shy in German, English, or French. <laughs> Good. Thank you for the presentations on uh, both sides. I'm very... Um, for me, it's very interesting to see that we are planning for such a long time what we call flexible, flexibility, and it means uh, very often you can put the wall down and put it up somewhere else, and nobody ever does it. You showed an example where you did it in the sixth district because you know how to do it, uh, and but usually people don't do it. They, they would rather change the flat than using the possibility to change a wall. So what's very interesting for me is to uh, see how you offer small units in a flat uh, that has the flexibility is there, so there's a sliding wall or there's something you can just change and people use that. We, we can see it in Gemeindebau now even uh, in, in Seestadt with the sliding walls, people are using them very nicely. Mm -hmm. And and that's uh, was so interesting for me in, in this concept and I would like to hear, do you have uh, experience or can you talk about uh, what how people are using it, how they uh, uh, act to this in, and compare to the possibility that it could put down a wall and uh, or not. Is that uh, something that you you see it really has developed further? Uh, people are using it uh, more or are using it in general? I I don't know really what to answer. Uh, we. <laughs> um, the elastic apartment we never built in this really uh, radical way, so we don't have the experience from it. But uh, I think we we did a lot of uh, we did the Praterstraße 25 years ago or so, which was a um, a very abstract room. Um, I would say so a room that you cannot say what what is this is it a living room or is uh, is it a room to sleep or is Dance it a floor. kitchen? Sorry? A dance floor. Yeah, yeah well, a dance floor. <laughs> um, and there it is interesting what they do with it, no? And how they use it. And But it depends on the situation, no? Uh, if they have a child or not, and so on. Or I, can, I can share a 
Uh, sorry, I, I don't know if uh, I can speak or not because yeah. uh, I don't see. Yeah, no. <laughs> just go for it. I just can share uh, my French experience, but in France, when you rent uh, an apartment, you can't uh, des demolish uh, a wall or something because you have to respect uh, the apartment. But when you are an owner, you can do it. So for my part, uh, I've got some projects where we can uh, build walls or demolished walls, like the third project I've presented uh, with uh, the little corridor, for example, and some other projects where we can't do it. So that's why we propose uh, some, um, some sliding uh, doors, for example, some things to make different propositions with the same spaces so we, we've got two, I don't know if it's the same for you, but we've got really two different realities to think about the way people can um, interpret uh, our uh, plan. But I think even if people, will, maybe not many people will swap their rooms or really like mm. move around their furniture, but that you can use it differently from the beginning saying like, I'm sleeping there, she is sleeping there and I'm cooking there. I think it's, 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 it's has a lot of, uh, has a lot of freedom. And doors are wonderful inventions. <laughs> you can close <laughs> them, <laughs> leave them open. Any more questions from, yeah, Lina? Yes, um, thank you very much for both of the lectures. Um, of course, we know, sitting here, we know the Austrian system and we know that uh, Pipergi's work is very exceptional and that, that the fight against the uh, uh, conventions is the one that you, you're doing constantly. And, um, what I would be interested in uh, is uh, in France, your work, Sophie, uh, would, how would you place that in context of the production of housing? Because I think it's equally exceptional. It's not that it's so much easier. And therefore, I guess that you also have um, specific circumstances and clients that enable these projects, competitions, calls, um, circumstances that just make these projects possible and, and without mm. wanting to diminish the, the, the gains and the successes of the project. I always think it's very interesting to know a little bit what makes it possible for such ex exceptional architecture and housing to, to come into being. Yes, uh, I don't have any receipt because uh, um, for each project, each project is a new, new story and sometimes uh, for me, some marvelous project uh, did not um, uh, were not ch chosen for competitions, and uh, perhaps what uh, the one who are built are not the best one. I don't know, but um, in France we've got some uh, competitions, uh, as you, I think. And um, sometimes uh, it makes me win. But it's really difficult because uh, I was exposed to a sort of new problem to show uh, the quality of the project is how to represent the uses. At the beginning of my work, I said, well, how can I explain what, hap what can happen in those apartments? So I, I worked a lot to find um, graphic representation to show the uses. So, Competitions sometimes win and sometimes, for example, for the second project, um, it was a competition, but without project. It was a competition just with a, a note where you say what is housing design for you. So it was a sort of uh, proposition to work with uh, just only with uh, rooms and uh, they, they said, okay. So it was a sort of collective adventure with them. So they were interested in uh, ex experimentation, but they were also really, really standout uh, um, owners. So it was 
quite uh, sometimes quite difficult. You know, for example, the in this project you've got very big windows because um, you don't have so much windows, so we you've chosen to make them bigger than uh, than normally. And our clients say, no, we can't do so so big uh, windows. We we can you please uh, divide them in two windows, two little ones, because the people will put their furniture just in front of the facade and will see uh, uh, some horrible things from the in from the outside. <laughs> and we said no, it's impossible. In our head, we said no, it's impossible because we have. Uh, 240 rooms, so we will have 240 windows. It's impossible to have more. And uh, at the same moment, we said, yes, but um, what they said is, is interesting because if they say that it's not interesting to have a sofa on the window, it's okay because it's not good from the outside, but it's a real nice situation to live, to be there, just in your sofa, just near to the, the window. So that's why we decided to have those very big windows with a bench. We propose it to say, yes, the people will put them on the windows, but it won't be trash from the outside. So we propose this. It was a very difficult uh, discussion. And as you, um, we made a very big model, a one-one model, to show the window to sit in and they say, oh yes, it's fantastic, okay. So sometimes we need some, some strategy uh, just to defend our project and the model is, is really, really interesting for this. It's interesting that the one-to-one -one model is still so important to mediate architecture. It's really, really interesting. Yeah. Even to clients who should be able to read plans. But we don't do other things than one-to-one -one models, no. <laughs> Normally we build it and it is a one-to-one -one model. Yeah. It's always a problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Any more questions, comments? Everyone shy? Then I would like to say thank you to all of you. It was really wonderful and very inspiring and uh, very encouraging to see your work. And I hope we see many, many more projects of both of your offices in this way. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Greetings. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. <laughs>